And we have a function f of x equals x plus 6 divided by x minus 3. We are told from the get-go that this function is 1, 1 to 1. And therefore, we are asked, find f inverse. So if the function is not 1 to 1, there is no point in asking, find the inverse, because it's not 1 to 1. Ready? Step 1. We replace f of x by y. y equals x plus 6 over x minus 3. Step 2. I interchange x and y. Is this OK so far? In step 3, I'm asked, or I have to, solve for y. Can anyone give us an idea how to solve for y? Right. Or you can simply say, oh, it's a proportion. y plus 6, we did that a long time ago, equals x times y minus 3. We're solving for y, remember. So we have to distribute y plus 6 equals xy minus 3x. <coughs> and there are two terms with y. Since I'm solving for y, those terms have to be on one side. So I have y minus xy equals negative 3x minus 6. Can I before? Yes. So um, y plus 6 equals x, <coughs> y minus 3. You did it by cross multiplication? Yes. So, so one time This times this is this. This times this is this. Okay. And then I distributed. Everyone on, on track? Yes? OK. Then I distribute it. And then I move this term to this side and this term to this side. Now here, what do you think we should do? I cannot combine them. Remember the key words always. Factor, simplify, descending order, no negative leading coefficient. Exactly. So I factor out y. I have 1 minus x, negative 3x minus 6. And the final step is this. <coughs> Too many negatives, so I will multiply the top and the bottom by negative 1 so to get 3x plus 6 over x minus 1. You don't have to. This is good. This is good. But I just don't like negative leading coefficients. So in step 4, f inverse is 3x plus 6 over x minus 1. Of course, x cannot be 1. Okay, how do you get the 1 minus x over? Um, I'm minus. solving for y, so I have to divide this by y minus x. Right? Yeah. Any questions? Any questions on this problem? I have one more, and then we'll look at um, Ella's questions. Sorry, bless you too. Thank you. So we have a function f of x, which is the square root of x. We are told it's 1 to 1, and we're asked the same question to find uh, f inverse. Now, can anyone give us the domain of this function? What do I have to write? Every time I see a, a root with an even index, what do I have, what can I have underneath? Or, or positive, right? Yes, so positive or zero. So what is the quantity under the square root here? Uh, or equal to 0. 
Good. So the, the domain is 0 to infinity or this. What about the range of this function? We graph this function in transformations. <coughs> How do we graph it? Just remember the graph. Yes, indeed, 0 to infinity. So here's the graph of the square root of x. We graphed it a long time ago, before our first test. So this is the square root of x. So then looking at the graph, you know that the range is 0 to infinity, or y greater than or equal to 0. So I would like to establish something very important and discuss it one more time. If this is set A and this is set B, and this is function f, and this is function f inverse, we like to write mathematically, we'll write f colon A arrow B. What does this make, mean? f is defined on A, set A, taking values in B. F defined on A, which means A is the domain, taking values in B, which means B is the range. What do you think I will have to write for F inverse? No doubt. Right. Good. So coming back to our function, if the domain of this function is this, and the range of this function is this. What will be the domain of f inverse? They have to be the same and switched. They have to be the same. We cannot invent anything. Negative How can it be negative infinity? We have to switch them. That's all we have to do, swap them. So, so f inverse will be defined on 0 to infinity and taking values on 0 to infinity. It happens that they are the same. So after we find f inverse, we will have to write x must be greater than or equal to 0. OK? So then y equals the square root of x is the first step. x equals the square root of y is the second step. We square now, right? We remember this from a long time ago then y equals x squared. But as we know, y x squared is not a one-to-one -one function. That's why we have to write comma x greater than or equal to 0. So the inverse function is x squared, but only when x is greater than or equal to 0. Because remember, this is x squared. It's not one-to-one. -one. But this piece is. So that's why it's asking you to identify the domain. Is this clear? Which part? So is the procedure of finding why f inverse correct? Is that clear? The function was this to find f inverse. Oh, I just think there's so much going on after that. Yeah, I don't know. But OK, so we'll come back. So f of x is equal to the square root of x. Do we understand the steps? Mm -hmm. So we, we understand that part, correct? Yeah. OK, so uh, perfect. So we know that f of x equals the square root of x with a domain greater than equal to 0. We understand that part. Yeah. Perfect. And I was asking, what is the range of this function? After we graphed it, we realized it's also 0 to infinity, correct? Yeah. Perfect. Then we just determined f of x to be x squared. But I cannot use the entire function. It's not possible. It's not one to one. Okay. And the range of f is 0 to infinity. It becomes the domain of f inverse. So that's why I have to write greater than root to 0. Is that better? Yes. OK, I explained too much, and I lost focus for a second, I guess, of explaining clearly. Then we had we had something else. Um, Ella, can you give me two of those or one or two? 
of those problems. I don't remember what they were. I know what they refer to, but I don't remember which problems. Okay, so exactly what we discussed. X plus 8 must be greater equal to 0, otherwise I will not be able to take the square root from it. So X greater equal to negative 8, so then domain negative 8 to infinity. And then the other one is um, G of X is equal to like, the square root of X minus 4 over X plus 8. Yeah. Um, and then Perfect. So in this case, this is basically um, a division of two functions. Right? Or if you want to say a multiplication of the square root and 1 over x minus 6. That's even better. However, I look at this function. The question here is asking us, the problem is asking us to find the domain. I know for sure that x cannot be 6. Because if x is 6, this entire ratio will be undefined. Is that clear? Also, I have a square root that I just had in a, a minute ago. So the second condition must be x minus 4 greater than or equal to 0, because otherwise that piece at the top will not exist. So in the past, we said, don't worry about the numerator. OK. But if the numerator has a square root, then I do have to worry about it. So this function has a domain that must fulfill two conditions to make the square root exist and make sure that x is not 6. Are you with me on, on this one? Is that clear? OK, so here I have x green equal to 4. And when I graph it on the real line to see what's happening here, greater than or equal to 4 is somewhere this. I don't care for units. But specifically, not 6. Not 6. So domain will be 4 to 6 union 6 to infinity. It's a very good point you're making because I did not get the chance to show a problem like this in class. And also, one other type of problem that I wanted to start with tonight is to graph. We are given the graph of the function. If it's 1 to 1, graph the function that is the inverse. We did not do that last time. Okay, any questions on this problem or this problem? We had something similar to this some time ago, but as I mentioned, I have yet to see one student who likes the square root. I have yet to meet one. Cece, go ahead. Which one? Uh, this one? Yes. Sure. So um, if you look at on page 310, <coughs> uh, here is uh, problem uh, 27. Twenty-seven on page 310, in which we have um, f of x, the square root of x minus 2 divided by x minus 5. Uh, I think Eli, I think I saw a sum of two radicals in there, yeah, too? OK. So here is another uh, example, like 26. After we do 27, we'll look at 26. h of x equals the square root of x minus 3 and x plus 4. Very good. Excellent problems. Ready? OK. So uh, like before, I look at this function and I realize that there are two conditions. x cannot be 5 and x minus 2 must be greater than or equal to 0. Otherwise, I would not be able to take the square root from it. Would you agree so far? Mm -hmm. Yes, everyone? CC, is this okay? Um, no, no, no. It's it does not equal to. Better. Uh, this is then a numerator. The numerator can be zero, 
But since I have the square root, this quantity must be greater than or equal to 0. So for this reason right here, any even root requires positive numbers or 0 underneath. Is that OK? So then from here, I have x greater equal to 2. I put it on the real line. Greater <coughs> equal to 2 is this. But I have to remove 5. So in order to remove 5, the domain will be negative uh, 2 to 5, union 5 to infinity. So you say, you say you have to remove 5 because it can't be 5. Correct. So you. So when you write it, you're going to write 2, 2 to <coughs> 5, union 5 to infinity. Exactly. But it's not really counting the 5. It, it's not. With parentheses, it's not. With parentheses, it's not counting the 5. That's, oh, the so definition for, it, right? that's the definition of parentheses. It does not include 5. Okay, so the parentheses means that's not included. Yes. Okay, and the bracket is, yes. is equal to, so it does include it, yes. it's greater than whatever it is. Yes. Is it safe to say that all radicals in this case would be x is greater than or equal to, I mean, greater than or equal to, the, is that how you, how you would write it? No, because if I have the square root of 1 minus x, then I have 1 minus x going equal to 0, which is negative x going equal to negative 1. I divide both sides by negative 1. So the domain of this function is negative infinity to 1. Right, but you will always still use the... Yes, the condition, the, yes. The condition. What? Okay. Yes, yes, perfect. Yes, whatever I have under the square root or the fourth root or the sixth root, any even root, I have to set it greater than or equal to 0. You just showed that it changes because you multiply by... I mean, because I have, by because I have a, a negative leading coefficient, correct. Excellent, yes, indeed. But I just didn't want you to think that all... Radicals will have some domain that starts uh, from a number to the right hand side. It can be from the negative infinity to one as well. Is that better? Okay, perfect. So uh, let's uh, work on number 26 now. In number 26, can anyone give us those two conditions of existence of each radical? So the first condition will be that x minus 3. It must be right, and the other one, good. So this time I have to solve two inequalities. In the past examples, I had to solve an inequality with a non-equal term. So here, this is x going equal to 3, x going equal to negative 4. It's better to present them on the real line. So I present a greater than 3, and I present greater than or equal to negative 4. And now you tell me what to choose. Both. Exactly, both. Meaning? Meaning what? Infinite, I mean, uh, negative 4. You just said both. So then both. Let's choose both. Negative infinity. Let's choose both. Let's choose both. All right, three. <laughs> exactly. Three to infinity. That's that's exactly correct. You said both. Please choose both. You can choose one or the other or none. You must choose both. How is that choosing both? Can anyone explain? <coughs> can anyone explain? It's where they overlap, where I see two colors, where I see blue and purple. If I don't have blue and purple at the same time, it's not both. Correct? Very good. You know, you, you never like the least. If you probably would have explained that that way, maybe before I would have caught on in the beginning. But I want you to discover it. But I don't want to do that. <laughs> I wanted to discover I mean, because, it. Because the way you're, the, to me, the way you're explaining it, it's like I'm missing things, but I, I understand it. But you answered it perfectly. You said I both. You, but I couldn't tell you why, how to write both because. But we, but you understand now. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. See, we got to our target somehow. 
So here, none of them. Here, just one. Obviously, here, both, because they are both colors present. If I choose a number here, both functions will exist. If I choose a number here, only one of them. If I choose a number here, nothing will happen. Is that better? Yes, everyone? Therese? OK, awesome. Good. Do you have anything else for me? Excellent questions. Really excellent questions. I do. Say it again. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Oh, OK. I just didn't write down. So this was problem 26 on 310. Age of x equals the square of x minus 3 plus the square of x plus 4. And I do have um, to show a graph like, for example, this is what our, we didn't get the chance to do last time. This is the graph I want to look at. Oh, you can choose another if you don't want 38. Do you want another problem or is 38 okay? Okay, in 38, we're given a graph. Question, is this the graph of a one, oh, first of all, is it a function? Yes. By the vertical line test. Is this function one to one? Yes. By the, by the horizontal line test, this is one to one. Perfect. Question, can you write down for me any points that are clear? No ambiguity. Zero, 01, please write it down. Zero, 01, can you give me another point? Perfect, please write it down. Negative 1, 2, awesome. Can you give me another point? Negative 2, 4. So please write down all these three or the pairs. Uh, nothing just yet. So the first question was, so this is problem 38. I'll explain in a minute. On page 322. And we want to graph the function first. And here it is. You gave me three ordered pairs, correct? You gave me um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. You gave me uh, 0, 1. Uh, you gave me negative 1, 2. And you gave me negative 2, 4, correct? Mm -hmm. Good. I'm pl I'm, I plotted those points, and I am graphing the function. You will see what this function represents in chapter 4. For now, I'm going to just call it f of x. You told me two things. Very important. It's a function, and it's one-to-one -one by the horizontal line test. It's a function by the vertical line test, and it's one-to-one um, -one by the horizontal line test. Very good. The question is asking us to graph f inverse on the same coordinate system. In other words, both of them on the same graph. Good. So <coughs> let's talk a little bit or one more time about what the inverse function does. The function is applied to 1 and returns 10. The inverse function is applied to and returns exactly 1, right? Or another example. A function is applied to 2 and returns 5. The inverse function is applied to and returns 2. Exactly. Perfect. So now, I would like you to give me a couple of ordered pairs, maybe 3 that I could use to graph this function, which is the inverse. What I would like you to remember, can anyone tell me what I'm just graphing now? Yes, but we know this function from transformations. The simple linear function, which is? Y. Of course, y equals x is the simple linear function, perfect. Good. So can anyone give us a few ordered pairs that I could use to graph the inverse function of f of x? I gave you two examples, and I would like you to use that and come up with three points. Say it again. Of course. 
This point has to be symmetric on this side. So if we had 0, 1, the inverse function must have 1, 0, right? We just discussed that. What about this point here? If this point is on y equals x, if it's 1 for x, what will be for y? No. No. 1, 1. All points on this line are 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7. Reverse 7, 7. <laughs> right. So if the function crosses the line at this point, so will the inverse. Because if you want to reverse that, you can't. It's the same point. Only because it's on this line. Good. Give me another point, please. You can't. You have to say if the function has negative 1, 2, then the inverse will have negative 2. Uh, negative 1, 2 will be 2, negative 1. Very good. If the function has negative 2, 4, very good. So let's graph the function. And this is f inverse of x. Notice that, and I'm going to put it in writing in a minute, these have to be overlapping. So these two are symmetric, and these two are symmetric with respect to y equals x. Why? Because I'm reversing the ordered pairs. It must be. So let's write a note. The graphs of f and its inverse are always symmetric, you know the lazy person writes WRT as with respect to, <coughs> with respect to what? Line. The line, awesome, y equals x, excellent, thank you, well done. This is always, if you graph any function that is one to one and it's inverse on the same coordinate system, this will always happen. Because you have to reverse the order of the order of the coordinates in the ordered pairs. So this will always be true. Well done. Questions? So just one more time. The inverse. Please. The graphs of f and f inverse are always symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. So what were those numbers again? Two. So there's negative two. Four, so four. this point was 0, 1, so then here it has to be 1, 0. This point was negative 1, 2, so this must be 2, negative 1. And the last one was negative 2, comma 4, so it must be 4, comma negative 2. Good. Does it make sense? Okay. Any questions? <coughs> Any questions? Okay, I'd like to look at an application of inverse functions. Ready? The graph represents the probability of two people in the same room sharing a birthday as a function of the number of people in the room. Number of people in the room, the probability that two of those people share the same day and month as birthday. Okay. Uh, explain why f has an inverse function. How do I know it has an inverse function? Because it is one to one by the by the horizontal line test. It's one to one by the horizontal line test. Then they're asking us to describe in practical terms the meaning of f inverse applied to point two five f inverse applied to point 0.5 and f inverse applied to point 0.7. So, if I'm asked to find f of 30, then I will say the probability is 70% that two people in the room, if I have 30 people in the room, the probability is 70% that two of them will share the same month and day. 
if I have 50 people in the room, the probability is 0.95 or 95% that two of those will have um, the same, will share the same birthday. But now I am asked, find or explain what F inverse of 0.25 means. What does it mean? When the probability is 0.25, how many people should I have in the room if I want the probability 0.25 to that that two people share the same birthday? How many? 15. Uh, what is F inverse of 0.5? F inverse of 0.5. What would you say? So if I want the probability to be 50%, then it means that I will have to have roughly 20-something 20 something people in the room to guarantee if the problem if the functions works to guarantee that 50 with 50 percent chances that two of them share the same birthday and last but not least f inverse of 0.7 what would that mean how many people yes how many people should I have in the room to be 70% certain that two of them share the same birthday. I should have 30 people in the room. So that's how we look at the inverse function, meaning 30 comma 0.7 reverse 0.7 comma 30. If the function has 30 comma 0.7, the inverse function will have 0.7 comma 30 as an ordered pair. Going backwards. Is this okay? Okay. So I just want you to see another application of inverse functions. Yes. Yes. So for example, it's a very good question. So this was problem um, 67 on page 323. So let's say uh, f inverse of 0.7. They're asking us to write what it means. So this gives the number of people required for a probability of 70%. Uh, of having two people sharing the same birthday. So this is what they wanted us to explain. But now, yes, you're right, F inverse of 0.7 equals 30. So this was 0 0.7 comma 30. And uh, for function f, it was 30 comma 0.7. For function f inverse, 0.7 comma 30, because for function f, we had 30 comma 0.7. So one more time, f inverse of 0.7 gives the number of people, which in this case is 30, required for a probability of 70% of having two people sharing the same birthday. And for that, we needed 30 people. Excellent. Well done. Any questions? Any questions? OK, last section of chapter 2, 2.8. Any questions for me? Have we answered all of them that you had for me? Yes, Charisse, go ahead. Yes, please. It's back to the f of x. Yes? Uh, finding, is it, uh, finding the square root? Is that what it is? We so want to find the inverse? Find the inverse. So it's like of what x. function? Which function? It was just the square root of x. Okay. Yeah, Good. So it ended up being y equals? So the first step is y equals the square root of x. And then it then is <coughs> x equals the square root of y. That's the first step. And the second step, we interchange. Interchange. Okay. In step three, we square, which is x squared equals y. And in step four, we replace this y by f inverse. So step three, 
If so, for y. Yes. Which means in that case, you have to square. Square both sides. Why are we squaring again? I know you said this is what because the beginning or something. Yeah, like we because we solved radical equations. In order to remove the uh, power one half, y the square of y is power one half. So I have to square both sides in order to remove that power to get y alone to the first power. Okay. If I had uh, index three, then I would have cubed. Okay. Okay. But this is not good enough. I have to write greater than or equal to 0 because x squared is not 1 to 1. If a function is 1 to 1, its inverse will be 1 to 1, mandatory, because they are inverses of each other. Both have to be 1 to 1. So for example, see here, the green function that we just created, is it 1 to 1? Of course it is. By the horizontal line test, the green function is 1 to 1 because the blue function is 1 to 1 as well. The green function, don't forget what you want to say. The green function is the inverse of the blue, and the blue is the inverse of the of the green. They both have to be one to one. Yes, sorry? And the, hor can you, the horizontal line test, it's just hit, if it hits points horizontally. Yes, okay. so this function hits the graph in one point, you read only one x. For each y, so the function says for each x, I have only one y. Furthermore, for each y, I have only one x for the function to be one to one. That's why by the horizontal line test, the horizontal line, any horizontal line, hits the graph in only one point. But it still would have went over something. So that's the problem. That's the problem with this. Because we know how to graph this function. It's this. We graphed it so many times, but this is not one to one. But now this one is. But I have to remove this piece. That's why the domain has to be there. Which means only this. Exactly. Right? Because this will be the square root of x, and this will be x squared. But not with this. OK, so 2.8 has three different situations in it. Uh, one is the distance formula. The second one is the midpoint formula. And the last one is the equation of a circle. So let's start with the distance formula. Mm, let's suppose I have A and I have B, and I connect them with a line segment, and I would like to determine this distance. I would like to determine the distance AB or just D. I'm going to label point A as x1, comma, y1, and point B as x2, comma, y2. In that case, this piece here, that's not a good color, this is x1. What is this? Excellent. What is this? And what is this? Good. I will form a right triangle by drawing a parallel to the x-axis and a parallel to the y-axis. And I will form a right triangle with a 90 degree angle here. This is a leg, and this is another leg. Can you explain the x ones and q's and y's and what If this is 7, then this must be 7. If this is 8, this must be 8. If that's 7, it must be 7. If it's yeah. What is 8? So any point on the coordinate system mm -hmm. has an x1 and a y1. How will I plot 3, comma 2? 3, comma 2. So that's why x1 must be this distance and y1 must be this distance. Yeah. The <coughs> same thing for any point. Okay. In order to locate the point somewhere, I have to have the x and the y. And I use the generic ones to show the generic formula.
and then we'll apply it in problems. So now we know the Pythagorean theorem. Can anyone apply it for us in this triangle? Not before you tell me the leg, the length of the leg one and the length of the leg two. Uh, yes, but the hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the leg squared. So I cannot say a squared plus b squared equals c, c squared because I have to identify which one is a, which one is b, which one is c. But if I say the sum of the legs squared equals the hypotenuse squared, then I'm on the right track. But yes, that's what I meant. So can anyone give us this measure? <coughs> That's why I have x2 and I have x1. So what is this measure? x1 squared? No, x1 plus x2 minus x2. Or x2 minus x2. Excellent. x2 minus x1. Awesome. What about the other leg? Minus 2 minus x2. Very good. Do we all agree with this? That this is x2 minus x1 and this is y2 minus y1. Everyone? Do we all see it? Yes? Okay, perfect. So now let's put it in the Pythagorean theorem. And please tell me what to write. And I lost track. Six, seven, eight. Excellent. X2 minus X1 squared plus. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. This is all I needed. Of course, we would like to take the square root from both sides. So we write the square root. And normally, when I write, when I take the square root from both sides, what do I have to write? Always. Plus or minus. But I don't have to in this case. How come? Am I changing the rules on you? No. But it's a distance. That's why I will not put minus in front. Yes. So this is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And this is it. <coughs> and this is the distance formula. Can I simplify it? Can I apply the square root to the right hand side and say blah, blah, blah? Please say no. Thank you. Uh, because the square root of a sum cannot be simplified. So this is carved in stone. No, no one can simplify this. The other thing that I was going to ask, no matter what numbers we plug in, what type of number will this be? Yes, because it's squared. What type of number will this be? Because it's squared. And when I add a positive number to a, neg to a positive number, would you ever write that the distance is the square root of negative 47? No. I'm happy we agree on that. Yes, of course. Yes. Good. So now, let's talk about the midpoint. What is the midpoint? It's a point on the line segment right in the middle of it such that this piece equals this piece. The name, the lab, it's labeled M. Midpoint. The coordinates of the midpoint are the average of coordinates. The average of two numbers is the sum over 2. x1 plus x2. And what do you think the other one is? y1 plus y2. So the x coordinate of the midpoint, the sum of x is over 2. The y coordinate of the midpoint, the sum of y is over 2. I am ready to. Uh,